Okay, let's get started. Thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Very good. So, I'm Atul Prakash, uh, Chair of CSC, and it's my pleasure to host uh, Dimitri here. Um, Dimitri was one of our PhD students, um, and uh, I got to give credit to Ed Durfee. He was the uh, mentor and uh, PhD advisor for Dimitri. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Ed uh, is a professor emeritus. He retired 2021 uh, from uh, the AI lab here. Uh, he did a lot of fantastic work in uh, distributed AI, in computational agents working together to solve complex problems and adjusting their behavior. Uh, that might sound a lot like kind of work that Dimitri is doing with his autonomous vehicles. Hopefully you see the connection. Uh, so I'll hand the mic to Ed to further introduce Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome our esteemed alumnus and awardee, Dr. Dimitri Dolgov. I met Dimitri in March of 2001, if memory serves correctly. He was a first year PhD student on a fellowship and he needed to find a project and, advi and an advisor to work with the upcoming summer. And I don't know how I got lucky enough to have him approach me to ask me to, to work with him, but I'm very lucky that I was there for that. Um, <clears throat> uh, within a week, he'd come up with a project. Um, over the summer, he did uh, well above and beyond what was expected for that project, turned it into a paper that was our first joint paper of many papers to follow. Within the first year working together, um, he was teaching me mathematical programming techniques for uh, the kinds of problems that we were solving in time-constrained, resource-constrained, multi-agent systems um, that were much more elegant and powerful and flexible than the uh, iterated algorithm techniques that I had been using up till that point. Um, so his method formed the basis of his highly regarded dissertation. Um, that he finished in 2006, and that contributed in part to his being named one of AI's 10 to watch in 2008. The methods he pioneered were also successfully built on by other um, uh, students of mine to solve other challenging multi-agent planning problems. Um, and it's good that they took it in that direction because after getting his PhD, Dimitri himself pivoted to this newfangled area of self-driving cars. Um, you can see how that's worked out for them. Um, after a stint at Toyota Research Institute here in Ann Arbor and as a postdoc on self-driving cars at Stanford, in 2009, he was one of the founders of Google's self-driving car project, which became Waymo in 2016. Since then, he's held various leadership roles at Waymo, including chief technology officer and now currently the co-CEO. He's received a Smithsonian Ingenuity Award, and he has more than 90 patents many of which I should mention have more citations than the papers we wrote together 20 years ago. So I guess it, I can forgive him for not going into academia like I'd hoped to. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dimitri back. All right, uh, thanks, Ed. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Computer Science Department. Uh, for this award. I am incredibly grateful and uh, deeply humbled by receiving and you know, having the opportunity to stand here today and talk to you about uh, Waymo and autonomous vehicles. Uh, now, in thinking about this talk, um, I uh, have reflected on my uh, journey uh, in education and then in uh, professional uh, life after you know moving on from Michigan, and uh, you know, it's very clear to me just how critically uh, important, uh, invaluable, and foundational this time uh, at Michigan in grad school here you know was uh, for me. So I, as you see on the slide, I started uh, in uh, on my bachelor's. I worked on physics and math math and service of physics. Then uh, for my master's, I you know, drifted towards applied math. Uh, then for my PhD, I worked in computer science. And then for postdoc and beyond that, I started working with you know, robots 
and autonomous vehicles. So you see it's been kind of a, a gradual, consistent drift to you know, what some might call the dark side of a very applied engineering. And uh, I like it. I like it on the dark side. So I want to thank you know, Michigan for being a key part of that, you know, on that journey and that transition. Uh, but you know, a bit more seriously, I, I, as I reflect on, you know, reflect on the time here, it, it, you know, it's, been, it's hard for me to overstate just how important this is. All the stuff that I learned here, uh, you know, as Ed mentioned, uh, my dissertation, my work here was uh, on uh, integrated resource allocation and planning in stochastic multi-agent environments. So, you know, okay, setting aside the resource allocation part, think about uh, planning in stochastic multi-agent environments. Uh, that is kind of the core, if you think about, of this task of driving. Right? It's nothing but this you know, multi-agent complex interactive problem and with a lot of ambiguity, with a lot of uncertainty, and a very complex nuanced reward function. So you know, while you know, not a whole lot of stuff carried over from you know, in terms of specific techniques from the PhD, the work that I did uh, here to uh, the field of autonomous vehicles, and at that foundational level, I think you know, uh, I was always interested in that. Um, and actually, I, I went back and I, I looked at my thesis and uh, yeah, this, is, this is literally the first equation I had in the intro. Uh, it uh, you know, captures the expected utility of a Markov process, uh, you, know, uh, um, uh, you know, discounted over an infinite time horizon. And then I looked at the paper that we published uh, at Waymo, actually in collaboration with uh, Google Research uh, just a year ago. Uh, That's what you see on the other side. Uh, it's a great paper, um, you know, I encourage you to check it out. It's called, uh, the title is Imitation is Not Enough, Robustifying Imitation with Reinforcement Learning for challenging driving scenarios. And that was also the very first equation in that paper. This is the same thing. So, you know, while some of the specifics have changed, and you know, I was lucky if I could do some linear programming with maybe 100 variables, and now we have, you know, transformer-based uh, deep nets with many billions of parameters. And, you know, some of the foundational stuff, like, you know, the Bellman equations and the Markov processes have a you know, pretty good shelf life. So, uh, uh, and uh, maybe uh, even more importantly than you know, some of the stuff that I learned here, I, as I would say the, uh, the time that I had here and this um, uh, Ed's uh, mentorship and the support that he gave me and the time that I had here to kind of explore the space, try to formulate uh, a research problem and you know, uh, you know, bump my head against you know, doing something wrong and then you know, going in a different direction. And, uh, uh, and the mentorship that I'd had, and now that I look at, back at it, I think the, you know, the superhuman patience that you had uh, with me is uh, very, very much appreciated. And, uh, and I think that just in thinking back about Michigan, I think the, I mean, the PhD program is all about that, you know, becoming independent, you know, kind of exploring the space. I think the setup you have here uh, is just uh, uh, absolutely amazing. So cherish, if you're in that program, please you know, cherish it. Okay, uh, so uh, after the PhD, um, I moved on to uh, autonomous vehicles, and you know, that was almost 20 years ago, and that's, that's what I've been doing ever since. That's the only thing that I've been doing since then. And it has not been boring for a, uh, a minute. And there, there, there are a few things that, in my mind, make this kind of a uniquely exciting uh, space. So I listed three main reasons here. The first one is just the impact of the mission, uh, making transportation safer and more accessible. I think many of you have probably heard the numbers. There's more than you know, 1.3 million uh, lives that are lost to car crashes worldwide every single year. In this country alone, it's more than 40,000 people. Uh, like, that's not okay. The status quo is not okay. Right, so we can and uh, you know, we should uh, try to do better. And the exciting part is that you know, this technology promises uh, to uh, make the situation much better. And what's even more exciting is that today we're starting to you know, actually now start to see empirical, you know, truly uh, validated uh, benefits in the field. So, you know, talk about that in a second. Uh, so to me, the second thing that makes it so exciting is just technology. It's just the breadth and the depth of it, from you know sensors to uh, and compute platforms to AI, you know, offboard, onboard, real-time computation. There's just so much going on, and all of those systems have to work, uh, and all those components have to work uh, really well together. All those fields have to come together in order to produce you know a system of that capability and performance. And uh, all of those areas are just so dynamic that you can, it's just uh, uh, super super interesting. Uh, and the last thing is just the product, right? I, I've taken 
at this point probably uh, thousands of rides in our vehicles, and you know, still every time I get into one or I see them driving around with nobody in it, you know, I get a, I get a kick out of it. So you know, it's important, interesting, and super super fun. Uh, so at Waymo, uh, we uh, uh, talk about ourselves as uh, um, an autonomous uh, vehicle uh, company. So we think of ourselves as building a driver, and our mission is to be the world's most trusted driver. And you know, we understand that trust doesn't, you know, you, you don't get it um, uh, a priori. I kind of think of it as having to, you know, the right to earn the trust of our writers, of the communities that we bring in every day. So that's been kind of the guiding principle of the, a lot of the uh, work that we've been doing. And uh, today, uh, as I just mentioned, we are starting to see some real tangible benefits of this technology. So it's not, you know, it's always been kind of the vision, the dream that, you know, when we get to scale, you know, good things should happen. Uh, but today, I mean, it's still early days, but uh, there's you know, trillions of miles driven in this country, you know, more than 10 trillion miles worldwide. Uh, but you know, we're starting uh, to see uh, scale at which you, know, you could actually see you know, real impact on you know, people and injuries that are happening on the road. And we feel like uh, we feel very proud of our safety record. Uh, and it's uh, personally very rewarding to you know, actually uh, see the technology and the product that we've built have that impact on the roads today. So this is, this is some data uh, that speaks to that. Uh, this is something we published uh, pretty recently. It's based on uh, about 22 million miles uh, of uh, in-the-field deployment in uh, fully autonomous mode, what we call rider only, when there's no person behind the wheel. Uh, and the results that we're showing here, and we just you know, published that on what we call the safety hub on, hub on the Waymo uh, website. Uh, so the safety numbers here are a comparison of the Waymo driver uh, to a human benchmark. Right? And it's sliced by uh, different severity levels, and we're looking for each severity level at the frequency of uh, collisions in that severity bucket. So you see that uh, it starts with the kind of lower severity police reported crashes, and we talk about injury causing and the most severe being airbag deployments. So in all of those, I see that we are, the Waymo driver is significantly outperforming the human bench benchmark by a factor of two for the lower severity ones and about a factor of six when it comes to the more severe ones. So we're very you know, significant, empirically, you know, statistically significant, uh, and that trend where the impact, the positive impact is the strongest on the higher severity ones is exactly what we would want, what hoping to see and we're happy to actually see that. Uh, so, and that is just statistics. This is just the frequencies of um, these events occurring uh, without any attribution of cause or notion of at fault. If you bring that into the picture, uh, the results are even stronger. So that's something we have done a while ago. We have we actually worked with a third party, uh, Swiss RE, which is, uh, I think, the largest global uh, reinsurer in the world. Uh, it kind of, you know, that, that's what they do. Uh, so we shared our data with them. They analyzed it, and the results that they came up with show that, you know, we reduced uh, the frequency of property damage claims by 76%, about a 4x reduction, and then the, uh, we reduced the bodily injury claims by 100%. So in that data set, there was no you know, uh, bodily injury events with meaningful you know, contribution from the Waymo driver. So that, that is also you know, yeah. even more exciting. Okay, uh, so talk a little bit about you know, uh, the journey uh, that I've been on and how I got started. Uh, as you know, Ed mentioned in the intro, I uh, was lucky to get involved in what's called the DARPA competitions. Shortly after the graduation, they had uh, three competitions, the DARPA Grand Challenge. Uh, they had you know, two of those. The task there was started in 2004. The task was to drive 100 miles in a, in a, in a desert, so a static environment. But at that time, that was like the Grand Challenge uh, in robotics. Um, and uh, it was successful, not in the first time, but in the repeat of the second time. And it was very successful in 2005. Uh, and after that, they constructed a third competition that they called the DARPA Urban Challenge. Uh, and there, the task was to kind of um, uh, mimic in a you know, close course uh, setting uh, the environment that we all drive in on public roads. So it had a, you know, a bunch of robotic cars and a bunch of uh, human drivers with stunt drivers on a cl close course. And uh, the, you know, the task was to design and build an autonomous vehicle so that can navigate all of that. So I was on Stanford's team, and uh, you know, we came in second. And you know, that, that really, that, that, at that point, I was really hooked. I, you know, I remember the first time I you know, had wrote some code and then put it in the car, and it drove around in the parking lot, you know, threw some codes. Uh, and you know, we stayed up testing until like 3 a.m. Uh, and I went home and I just could not sleep. I could not you know, uh, get a moment of sleep that night. I was just so excited. And you know, that was 
what, if I'm doing the math right, 17 years ago? Uh, uh, it, it's been quite a journey. Um, so after the urban challenge, uh, you know, uh, DARPA kind of declared mission accomplished, you know, they do more basic research. Uh, so the question was, you know, what, what's next? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, fortunately for us, this, uh, uh, this whole, I would say, you know, even the whole field, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the founders of Google, were keeping an eye on this competition. So then, you know, this, we started this project uh, at Google. Uh, you know, the early name was Project Chauffeur, and where I was, you know, one of the, the founders. And, uh, you know, this is, this is some pictures from that time. Uh, it was a small team, it was about a dozen uh, engineers or so. You know, we, we took a Prius, we instrumented it, we put a bunch of sensors on it, you know, a computer in it, you know, those were off the shelf sensors. And it, you know, that was a hell of a lot of fun. It's like, you know, the early days of a startup when everybody's doing, you know, everything and you, things are moving very fast, you're learning, you know, every, you know, every minute. Uh, and, you know, one, one hour you are writing some code, then, you know, the next hour you are, you know, messing with the hardware and you know trying to get the car you know, to you know boot up and then you know you're doing some testing and values. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, see some pictures here of a couple of us, you know, hacking on the car. Uh, you know, ask me after the talk why this gentleman is wearing a colander on his head. Uh, it, I promise you, it has a very specific. You know, had uh, a specific critical practical purpose for the bring up of the vehicles. So it's not just a fashion statement, but we can talk about that later. Um, so uh, when we started this thing at Google, uh, our you know in those early days, the goal they were not thinking about you know a product or you know commercialization you know company. We, we just wanted to learn. Right? Just coming off of the DARPA challenges, we wanted to understand you know, how hard the problem uh, space is. So with that goal in mind, uh, we uh, created a couple of uh, milestones for ourselves. One was to drive 100,000 miles you know, in full autonomy. Uh, well, no, uh, full autonomy, I use that term differently from actually how I use it today. Uh, this was with a, you know, somebody behind the wheel, but you know, the car had to do you know, everything. Uh, and at you know, that time, that was a very big number. Uh, and the second milestone was to drive 10 routes. Uh, each one was about 100 miles long. Uh, and uh, you know, we had to uh, complete each one from beginning to end with no disengagement, no intervention from you know, a human driver. You could try that multiple times, but you know, 100 miles with no intervention was, uh, you know, uh, since 2009, that was, uh, that was a high bar. And uh, you know, see some of the routes here, I actually see all of them here. Uh, they, as you can see, they were chosen you know, very carefully, very specifically, you know, sampled the full complexity of this driving task. You know, we had some going from Mountain View, you know, Google headquarters to San Francisco, and you know, probably the most convoluted, uh, longest way possible. It took like four hours to get there. Uh, then we had some going up and down the coast, uh, up and down the Bay Area. There was one called bridges here that uh, spent time on freeways and went through all the bridges in the Bay Area and you know some uh, around like Tahoe, like a big 300 mile loop. Uh, so it took us, uh, here's, here's a video of uh, that. Uh, of that driving uh, that we did, uh, you know, this is sampled from those routes, um, and uh, you know, you can see that we're driving on surface streets uh, with you know pedestrians and traffic lights. You know, the car had to even in those days you know, deal with like all of the uh, uh, complexity of the task and had all the capability. Uh, drove on three ways uh, through you know Tolbus, uh, had some uh, dense downtown environments. I think this is in Monterey, uh, which can be very yeah, uh, a pretty touristy uh, attraction uh, in uh, California. Uh, this is Lombard Street uh, in San Francisco, you know, super windy, lots of pedestrians uh, being very interested in you know, what's going on with the car here. Uh, so you know, it, was a, it was a good setup. We, you know, we, we uh, handled freeway merges and uh, construction zones. Um, and you know uh, a few other interesting things, uh, but you know, it took us about uh, just under two years to uh, accomplish this milestone to finish all those routes. Uh, and you know this was back in the technology of 2009 with a team of about you know a dozen people. So it kind of you know illustrates that it's and it was invaluable. Like how might the, the the what we learned about the complexity uh, of the space uh, and you know uh, how to go about it was you know super super valuable in those early days. Uh, but it kind of you know, goes to underscore and highlight this property of this whole domain that it's you know very easy to get started, but it's insanely difficult to go all the way you know to like actual performance of the system where you can you know with confidence uh, remove the driver from the driver's seat right so it's been you know 15 years you say, you know, say well you know why you know, the car can handle everything right all the features had all the capabilities right you know, feature complete but then you know it actually takes 15 years of really hard work uh, uh, and lots of resources to actually get it you know all the way 
Um, okay, so that's uh, that's where we started. So you know, here's uh, a, a slide uh, summarizing the journey. I'm not going to go through you know uh, all of the circles here. Uh, I wish there were many, uh, but I'll just highlight a few that I think are kind of the biggest uh, stepping stones for our, uh, our 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 company. And many of those have been historic steps for Waymo uh, and you know for the for the entire industry. Uh, so in uh, you know we started as I mentioned in 2009, and then in 2015 we had our kind of zero to one moment. Uh, this is the first time when we drove fully autonomously uh, without a person in the driver's seat. Actually, uh, nobody there uh, on public roads. This was in that yeah uh, funny looking marshmallow looking car that we called the Firefly, um, and uh, you know serves its purpose. Uh, we're excited about being able to take that first step, but you know, it's not something we then wanted to take to a product, to a business. So we switched to the next generation of our system. This was on the Pacifica uh, minivans with what we call the fourth generation of the Waymo driver. And then in 2020, we launched our, uh, that was the first time we launched a commercial service, a fully autonomous, you know, ride-only uh, service uh, that is open to the general public in Arizona. Uh, in, uh, in the East Valley, in the city of Chandler. That was you know, a decent size uh, market of about 80 square miles. Um, you know, while that was not the goal, we actually ended up capturing a decent you know, part of that, that, that market. Uh, and you know, when I say open to the public, I mean anybody could just download the app and you know, call the car, a completely empty vehicle will show up and you know, take you anywhere you want to go in that territory. So that was a huge step for us. Uh, but again, the point there was not to, on that fourth generation, was not to you know, scale and commercialize. It was to learn how to do the whole thing you know, end to end. So we learned how to build a system, how to do regular releases, how to evaluate it, uh, how to operate it 24 seven with real customers, get the feedback from them, iterate and improve. So that, that was uh, uh, super, super valuable. Uh, and uh, uh, strategically we made this decision to not you know, continue to incrementally you know, grow that, that, that service, that, that platform, uh, but instead make a discrete jump to the new version, which we call the fifth generation uh, of the Waymo driver that's on the uh, Jaguar i -Paces. This is what you saw in, uh, just outside the building. If you haven't seen it yet, you know, check it out. Uh, this is what is in production today. Uh, so we said, hey, you know, we're gonna uh, switch to a new car. We'll switch to a whole new hardware suite, new sensors, new computers. Uh, uh, let's also you know, switch to a different operating domain. So we went after the hardest, you know, densest parts of San Francisco. Uh, and you know, that was a bit of a stressful time. Right? You know, classical engineering fashion, we had like, the, the, the thing that was you know, kind of in maintenance mode and deprecated, and the new thing that's not quite working yet. Right? Uh, so we kind of put all of our eggs in that basket and move forward. And uh, it was, uh, looking back, it was absolutely you know, the right call. And then in 2022, we started our initial uh, rider-only operations on that platform in San Francisco. And then uh, that takes us to today, where you know we are operating uh, in fully autonomous rider-only mode uh, in these four markets: uh, in San Francisco, in Phoenix, in LA, and in Austin. They're you know, different levels of uh, maturity. Uh, San Francisco and Phoenix are the most mature ones. Uh, there, it's open to the public. Uh, you can again download the app uh, from you know, an app store. Uh, did I lose the mic? Apologies. There we go. Is that, is that better? Yeah. yeah okay. um, and uh, in San Francisco, we are covering the entire city. Uh, operating all you know, conditions is about 50 square miles. In Phoenix, it's over 300 square miles, so a good chunk of the you know, Phoenix metro. Uh, in LA, uh, it's open. Uh, you know, we have uh, external riders, but it's not open to the general public, so we still have a wait list. And then in Austin, I would just transition to the handheld. You want to try that? Okay. I think the battery is just kicking out. Apologies. All right, hopefully that works better. Uh, uh, and so in LA, uh, public riders, but uh, still a wait list and we're ramping that up you know, gradually and uh, responsibly, always with the you know, emphasis on safety. And Austin, you know, it's still earlier days. It's not yet open. Uh, overall, uh, we are operating at scale where we're doing more than 100,000 uh, paid rider-only trips every week. So it's about five million, you know, annualized, and the rate is increasing, uh, you know, quite rapidly. Uh, in fact, it took us about uh, three months to get from fifty thousand trips to a hundred thousand. So, it kind of gives you an idea of where we are in that exponential scaling curve. Okay, uh, so let's let me now transition uh, and talk a bit about uh, the technology and what, what uh, you know, kind of you know goes on behind the scenes in uh, the Waymo driver. Uh, 
I'll you know, split it into two sections. I'll talk a little bit about you know, hardware, and then the bulk uh, of the rest of the time I'll use uh, to talk about the Waymo AI that powers the Waymo driver. So on the hardware side, um, as I mentioned, we've uh, gone through several iterations of the Waymo driver. You know, the vehicle has changed, but more importantly, the hard hardware, the self-driving hardware on the vehicles have changed. You know, the first generation was, uh, uh, is what we called that Prius when we uh, started in 2009. Then we had the Lexus, and then we switched to the uh, Firefly, uh, and then the first. Uh, external commercial deployment was on the fourth generation, the Pacifica, uh, and now we're operating on the IPSs on the fifth generation, and we're bringing up the sixth generation uh, of our platform right now. Uh, at, a, at a very high level, you know, from the hardware perspective, the Waymo driver is um, uh, you know, a computer in the car, and it sees the world through a combination of sensors. We use three modalities, uh, cameras, lidars, and radars. They complement each other very nicely. You know, three modalities we have: 360-degree coverage around the vehicle. Uh, you know, cameras are nice; they give you, you know, pretty high resolution and uh, color. In uh, lighter, you know, get decent resolution, but also uh, kind of direct measurements of the 3D structure of the world. And radars are nice in that they you know, uh, are pretty robust to various environmental conditions, like you know, operating in rain, fog, you know, snow. And so, by combining all three, uh, we, we get the best performance out of the system. Uh, and th this is uh, you know, uh, a GIF that visualizes the different sensor modalities. So you see on the bottom, it's you know, obviously cameras. We have 360-degree you know, cameras with some overlapping field of view. Uh, at the top, uh, we're showing radar and lidar. So that heat map uh, on the kind of projected onto the ground is the return of our custom design and build uh, imaging radar. So you can see that you know, it doesn't just give you point returns; it gives you uh, kind of a, a more interesting uh, uh, you know uh, image. Uh, and it's also sensitive not just to you know, big metal things like cars. You can also see that you know, pedestrians and other smaller things show up pretty clearly. Uh, and then the, the bluish, so not bluish, uh, yellowish brown, stuff, that's the return from our lighters. So purely lighter, which kind of, you know, obviously measures the 3D structure uh, of the environment, but you can also you know, kind of see the type, you know, kind of resolution that we get from the sensors, which is you know, pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, we're now, as I mentioned, bringing up the sixth generation of the platform. And the main focus on, uh, in designing that system was on uh, simplification and bringing down the cost. And you also got you know, more capability from sensors and compute. And the vehicle itself, we worked with a, a company called Zeker uh, to design a vehicle uh, that was you know, specifically optimized for the right hailing application. So it's not designed you know, for the drivers, it's designed for the riders. And uh, that's something I'm pretty excited about. Uh, you can see you know, it's, it's very spacious inside. You know, I put a lot of thought into the kind of the UI in it. Uh, it's you know, very easy and convenient to get in and out. It has a flat floor, it has flat floor, it has you know, sliding doors, so very convenient for you know, ingress and egress. And uh, you know that we're bringing that up right now. It's in testing mode, so we're doing some testing uh, in simulation and closed course, uh, as well as starting testing on public roads. So, very excited about you know, actually deploying that in the commercial service. Okay, uh, let's uh, switch gears and talk about the AI problem. Um, and I, I will touch on a few different aspects of this whole space. Uh, you know, the whole uh, field is huge, uh, so I won't be able to do it justice. But uh, I'll point you to uh, this. Uh, a page on our website, waymo.com research, uh, where we publish papers. There's about, I think, close to 100, a bit, uh, less than 100 papers there right now. So if some of the stuff that I talk about today is interesting, you know, go check it out, uh, get more details. Okay, uh, so what uh, makes this a challenging problem? And I, I do believe this is, uh, I'd say, you know, one of the most challenging AI problems we face today. Uh, in my mind, there's three main factors. One is that uh, you know, we have to operate in the physical world. It, with, there's a lot of noise, um, and just the, you know, the physical environment can be pretty humbling. Right? There's you know, lots of noise. There's many things that you know can happen, that kind of you know, pull you out of you know the happy part of your distribution training. So uh, you know, there's clearly sensing noise. You have to operate in different uh, environmental conditions. You have to deal with. Uh, yeah, uncertainty and the long tail behaviors from other actors. You know, humans you know, walk and bike and drive in all kinds of you know, uh, interesting ways. Um, uh, so you have to you know, cope with all of that. So the second thing that makes it so challenging is that it's a safety critical environment. So the bar and performance is just 
super, super high. And you know, with AI in some domains, you, know, you get some, you know, uh, sometimes it's creativity and it's great. You know, sometimes it's you know, a mistake that you can absolutely not tolerate and that's the nature of our environment. And the last thing is that all of this has to happen in real time. Right? We're, you know, we're, we're, we're putting this on the vehicle. Uh, you know, if you're driving at 65 miles an hour or, you know, or more on freeways or you know, 45, 50 on service streets, uh, you know, milliseconds matter. So there's, you have to kind of crunch all the numbers. We have you know, hundreds of millions of sensor readings coming into the system, into those models. Um, you know, every second, you have to process multiple seconds of it, and you have to make decisions in real time in order to guarantee that high uh, performance, of high, high bar of safety. Uh, and you know, I do uh, believe that you know, it's one of the most difficult AI problems. Uh, and you know, <laughs> I, I'm clearly not completely unbiased, but I do believe that you know, the Waymo AI is the most mature manifestation of today's you know, AI in the physical world, or you know, embodied AI. So here's, here's a clip uh, just to kind of illustrate some of the stuff that I was talking about. You know, here we are driving, and this is all fully autonomous. Uh, we're interpreting the gestures from a police officer, so you kind of you know, have to interact with the, uh, the environment that way. Here there's a construction zone going on. We have, there's a lane that's closed, so we have to you know, merge while interacting with uh, other agents. And, uh, here's another example of that, where there's a lane that's closed by a fire truck, so we have to understand the semantics of it, and we kind of have to negotiate our way with other cars. Uh, another example, I think, from San Francisco, where it's a very narrow lane. There's a truck coming up. There's another car behind us. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, so we you know, start to back up. You kind of have to reason about what the truck is doing. You also have to reason about what this car behind you might do, because you know, otherwise backing up doesn't make sense, because you know, you're kind of blocked from both ways. So it's a very interesting multi-agent uh, dynamic problem. Uh, and you know, here's another example uh, with a crowd of pedestrians, also very interactive. Like, you know, everybody. This is you know, a good example of just not you know, driving, not being something where just stay in your lane and not hit things. You kind of have to you know, uh, uh, understand intent, uh, make predictions, and kind of maneuver your way through this whole space. Uh, another example of complexity. Uh, and noise, uh, this is us driving in the rain, uh, pretty heavy rain. There's a traffic light, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a traffic light that's out, that's why we stop. Some of the human drivers do not. Um, and here's a, you know, uh, here's a good demonstrator of the kind of the safety critical and latency critical reactions that we have to do. There's you know, a truck that's coming, and we had to use the whole uh, you know, space that was available to us, even you know, going onto the shoulder. So that's hard. You know, it's hard to do that. But if you think about uh, the uh, the precision of your system that you have to, right? It's you know, it's it's hard to react uh, that way in this one scenario, but even What's even more difficult is making sure that you don't overreact and you don't have false positives in other benign situations and you're not swallowing or all the way. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a kind of a, a, a taste of what this space is like. Uh, and there's the long tail. Uh, you know, I mentioned it briefly. So here's some examples. All of those are from our logs. You have you know, pedestrians doing interesting things. Kids uh, do that a lot. It terrifies me as a, as a father. Uh, here's another example of a toddler running onto the road. Uh, people falling off skateboards. People falling off bikes. Uh, there's, there's a grill that fell off a truck at, you know, when, on a freeway when we were moving at you know, 65 miles an hour. Uh, in, a, in a rainstorm, you have power lines going down, uh, trees coming down, flooding. You know, uh, Police officers, traffic, traffic, et cetera. So you, you, you know, you get the idea. Uh, and uh, you know, some of this stuff. Uh, you know, I, I think some of this stuff you maybe you know have some intuition for. You know, what does it mean to drive in the you know harsh rain? I think we've all done that, right? What does it mean to drive through a construction zone or you know, uh, negotiate with a you know construction worker or a police officer directing traffic? Like we 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 all see that. Uh, some of the stuff uh, that we encounter uh, today uh, is kind of unintuitive for a human driver. Every week we drive significantly more than a human, average human driver in this country would drive in an entire lifetime. So just imagine kind of the complexity of the long tail that we have to deal with. All right, uh, so hard problem, uh, super interesting problem. And uh, we've been pushing on uh, AI, on kind of the, taking the uh, latest and greatest state-of-the-art AI techniques and applying them to our domain, and you know, in some cases, you know, you know, I'd say pushing the field forward. So here's a, a quick uh, timeline of kind of what it means to, you know, obviously AI over the last you know, decade or so has changed drastically. Uh, you know, we will say we've always used AI and ML, but you know, what that actually means is you know, night and day. Uh, so in the early days, we even had some you know, AI and ML, things like decision trees, some you know, classical computer vision. Um, that was you know, just the you know, little, little bits and pieces here and there. Uh, then a big uh, 
change, a big phase transition happened around 2013. Uh, this is the time when you know, convolutional, uh, convolutional, nets, convolutional neural networks uh, for computer vision really took off. It was the t uh, year, I think, of the famous uh, ImageNet competition where AlexNet uh, you know, really kind of uh, blew all the other techniques out of the park. So it was a big deal for computer vision, clearly had implications for us on the perception side, on you know, computer vision, but you know, also not just the cameras, but you know, for other sensors as well. So we started doing you know, a lot of that, applying a lot of that on the perception side of things. Then a big thing happened uh, in 2017 when Transformers came around. It was a huge deal for language, right? It's the, uh, yeah, uh, the kind of the foundational architecture behind all of the you know, big models, big language models that we see today. It was also a big deal for us. I'll, talk, you know, I'll give you some examples uh, in a little bit, but this is where it was really helpful for perception work, but also started to you know, uh, really help us advance the work on predictions, on planning, on simulation. Uh, and then we, you know, after in the uh, more recent years, we saw these trends of these models getting bigger, uh, and all the breakthroughs where we saw in large language models, LLMs, and visual language models, VLMs. So the kind of the thing that I'm uh, really excited uh, that we're working right now is you know, kind of combining the two uh, between the work that we have done on AI that is specific to uh, autonomous vehicles and what we see happening in the world of VLMs. Okay, so with that uh, uh, as a backdrop, uh, here's I think uh, kind of the, uh, the uh, easiest and best high-level way to talk about the uh, the AI behind the Waymo driver as we think about it today. You know, we internally refer to it as the Waymo foundational model, uh, and as I mentioned, it combines some of the elements uh, and some of our expertise that we've you know, built up over the years in AV-specific uh, tasks with the general knowledge of VLMs. Um, and at, at a high level, it's kind of a, you know, think of it as a, a encoder-decoder architecture. So the stuff you see on the left here, uh, this is the perception part uh, of this whole model, right? It's the encoder. Uh, and uh, the task there is to take all of the inputs from the sensors and then, you know, uh, encode them or compress them into some representation that, uh, you know, is uh, uh, lower bandwidth, is, you know, compressed. Uh, so you can do things, you know, higher scale on the other side of the uh, of this picture, uh, but captures all of the um, you know critical information up that you get from sensors that are relevant to this task of driving. And then on the other side, you have the decoder part, or what we call the behavior uh, part of the model. And uh, you know the task there is to you know generate behaviors, whether it's you know your own plan or your own actions when you're driving the car, or uh, you know anticipating what other people might do or in simulation, kind of generating the whole, you know, realistic new world states of how other people, you know, drive, uh, how people walk, how, you know, traffic lights change. And then you wanted to align it uh, with language you know, for uh, a number of really valuable reasons. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'm kind of intentionally being somewhat fuzzy here, but you, you also want to use a map as a prior. Uh, and you can think of it, a map as kind of like another sensor. You know, you have uh, uh, lighters, cameras, radars give you real-time sensing of the world, but then, you, you know, computers have good memory, right? So you want to you know, store that prior uh, and inject it into your system exactly, you know, how you do it and what point in the system, you know, I'm being somewhat ambiguous here. Don't want to get into that today. Uh, but the important part is that the system is uh, robust to uh, drop out or degradation in any of, uh, to any of its inputs. So you should be able to take away you know, one of the sensors, camera, light, or radar, or you know, make it more noisy, or take away the map, or make the map incorrect, or add noise to the map, and it should you know, maybe not drive quite as well, or perform quite as well, but you know, it should still you know, degrade and handle these kinds of cases robustly. Okay, uh, so in the rest I'll talk about you know, uh, a few I'll talk about the perception and encoder part, uh, a little bit about the behavior and the decoder part, and then uh, mention a couple of uh, things related to simulation. And yeah, I won't be able to do this whole space justice, uh, so I'll just kind of you know, sample a few things here and there, kind of give you some teasers of what the challenges are and you know, a little bit of a flavor of the solutions. Okay, uh, again, uh, the, you know, starting with the perception or the encoder model, it takes in as, uh, here are the tasks that it has to do, right? So regardless of the architecture, regardless of the uh, outputs, like these are the things that the thing has to be able to, you know, reason about. Uh, so take in all the sensors, fuse them in a way that's robust to noise and degradation, uh, reason about uh, you know, things across time, so integrate you know, not you know, just across modalities but across time, uh, reason about objects, 
you know, even you know, you know, again, regardless of the representation, you know, we are working in the space of objects. They have semantics, they have states, so you have to capture that somehow. Uh, and uh, also, you know, we want to be able to align that uh, encoder with uh, you know language. Um, okay, so looking at the uh, kind of the, the basic the basics of the that side and the perception on the encoder, uh, you know, the, the kind of the the table stakes foundational task is uh, object detection, uh, and uh, you know in the early days I mentioned convnets. Uh, this is what these convolutional neural networks were you know really good uh, at in computer vision, uh, and they're great when you are working on dense representations. So you have you know a dense tensor or you know simplest version being a, kind of an, an image. You run your convolutions on it and you know have some other layers and it works pretty well. Uh, the challenge, one of the challenges in applying this to our domain is that, you know, while your sensors might be dense in a perspective representation, right, you know, cameras or uh, lighters, uh, we really are kind of reasoning about things in a, you know, 3D space, or at least kind of a two and a half D space. Uh, so natural representation is this top-down view, what we call the board, um, bird's eye view, or BEV representation, and uh, that thing is sparse. Uh, and uh, we also uh, want to you know, care about uh, uh, very high resolution uh, and high accuracy of uh, object detection in that space, and we operate long range, so you know, hundreds of uh, meters. So just you know, directly uh, applying confidence to this has its challenges, uh, especially if you have to do things in real time. So we've came up with some interesting work in that space uh, that we call uh, transformer-based model architecture. We called it SW Former, sparse window transformer. Uh, we published it, I think, a couple of years ago in uh, uh, 2022. So here's a pointer. Like, and I'll, you'll see some of these tags in the bottoms. They refer to you know, uh, papers that we have on our website. So check them out for more details. Uh, but th this is an architecture that established at that point the state of the art, both in accuracy and uh, efficiency. And it was very valuable for us uh, for uh, this task of 3D object detection. Here's the, uh, yeah, you see that in action. It's just you know only running on lighter, but you know you get pretty good detection up to you know hundreds of meters on the freeways. And of course, there's just one component of your uh, encoder. Then you marry it with other things. Uh, there are many other things that go into perception, uh, like you know, object classification, uh, semantics. I'm going to you know, talk about, not talk about those. Uh, a more nuanced topic that I think is really interesting is kind of your choice of a representation between the encoder and the decoder. Right? And you have you know, a number of different options. You can you just you know, have embeddings and do an end-to-end -end training. And that works pretty well if you, you know, it's kind of the simplest approach that makes the most sense. If all you want to do is open loop imitation learning, so just go from sensors to you know, uh, imitating. Uh, decisions or you know, driving behaviors or trajectories, uh, it, it's not enough if you want to reach the level of performance that is, you know, allows you to take out the driver uh, from the driver's seat. So there you have to do other things. So uh, you have a choice of you know, various intermediate representations in terms of you know, kind of uh, a multiple dimensional space of how you know, compact they are, how um, you know, robust and stable they are if you're doing closed loop simulation. So you know, all the way on the other side, you have you know something as simple as just kind of you know ob boxes for perception objects. You know, has some nice properties, but clearly you know, insufficient to do any sort of interesting uh, work. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in between. You can do heat maps, semantic heat maps, semantic annotations. You know, a higher fidelity geometric representation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that that's a very important dimension. And in, uh, in in reality, it's not one of those things. It's a combination of those. And how you deal with them, how you train your system, how you you know design a simulator. Uh, uh, to support you know, those representations is where a lot of the real complexity lies. Uh, so here's uh, an example of one of those intermediate representations that we find useful, uh, something we call the pedestrian key point. Uh, you know, we're basically doing human pose estimation, uh, something we published, um, I think, a few years ago, 21 and 22. Uh, here you see us. Uh, for all the pedestrians in the scene, kind of estimating their pose, or kind of estimating the pose of all the joints, we estimate you know, the gaze and which you know, way people are looking. So useful to understand intent, useful to interpret gestures, as is in this scene where you know, police officers directing traffic understand what they mean, and you know, uh, on we go when it's our turn. Okay, uh, another thing I want to talk about is uh, of aligning uh, uh, or leveraging language understanding for this task of autonomous driving. So why, why do we want to do that? Uh, well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, first one is, yeah, that. Uh, <laughs> can anybody in the audience tell me if the answer is correct? 
Like, you know, okay, here's an image. Can I, you know, it's Wednesday 4 p.m. Can I park at this spot right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, it's actually, uh, so you can, you can give this to a VLM and, you know, we'll give the right answer. It is correct in this case. You can park there for one hour. Uh, but, you know, the point here is that there are many aspects to, in the driving environment, uh, whereas, you know, information that's relevant to what you should be doing or should not be doing is expressed through language. So, you know, we want to understand those. Uh, and a second reason is that uh, in these, you know, VLMs and LLMs, there is uh, general, they have common sense. They have some, you know, general understanding of how the world works, right? And that is very useful for us, especially if you think about, you know, operating in that you know, very long tail of scenarios. So here's an example. You can take this image, you know, give it to a VLM, say, hey, you know, I'm driving a car. This is what I see. Please tell me what's going on, you know, what I should, uh, you know, how, uh, what I should be mindful of and what I should do and, you know, uh, explain why. And it does a pretty good job. It says, you know, there's a car that's flipped on its roof. It's blocking, you know, uh, tracks. Uh, there's emergency responders. So you should be very careful, not block the first responders and, you know, proceed very cautiously, you know, uh, slow down. Uh, so, you know, there's some interesting there, there, right? Uh, so this is one of the areas that is, is super active, uh, super exciting in this whole space. Uh, you know, I can't go into uh, the, the, the details there, uh, but I, I will you know, show this is one of the papers we uh, published um, about a year ago. Uh, just kind of a demonstrator of this alignment uh, where you know, we took our uh, perception system, you know, some version of our encoder, and we aligned it with the encoders uh, for VLMs. And it was done with no human intervention. Uh, uh, um, uh, annotation, no human supervision, so no human labels. I just kind of aligned it to. And uh, the, the output is what you see here. So the camera images are not really used. This is just you know, for you to visualize the scene. But what you could do is just give this thing a point cloud, this model a point cloud at inference time, and then uh, give it open vocabulary prompts. Hey, hey, you know, is there a bulldozer? Is anybody jaywalking? You know, uh, is there a fire truck? And if there is, you know, can tell you like, these are the lanes, their points. So it's kind of a demonstrator of the alignment between language and uh, you know, our encoders and our perception system. And you can do a lot of really interesting things with that. All right, uh, moving on to the other side, the behavioral uh, part of the model or the decoder. And the test there is to take the inputs, the history of agent behaviors and states, you know, things, other things in the world like traffic lights, some information about the static uh, environment, uh, you know, where the lanes are, where the road is, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, decode it uh, in a generative fashion to produce uh, well, you know, trajectories uh, or you know, uh, action sequences of actions. Right, whether it's your own plan, your own trajectory, trajectories maybe jointly represented you know, with uncertainty and kind of joint uh, uh, distributions over states of multiple agents about what they're likely to do in the future, or in the simulator, just kind of rolling out the future sequences of you know, the, the entire scenarios, the entire worlds evolving. Uh, and there are a couple of, couple of uh, kind of high-level approaches at a very high level. You can do autoregressive models. That's closer to what you know, a lot of LLMs do. Where you, kind of, you produce a token after a token. Or you can use diffusion models. This is you know, uh, a lot of that you typically see in um, kind of higher-level continuous, uh, sorry, higher-dimensional continuous problems like video generation. So you know, we have some work in both of those approaches. Uh, they are... You know, they have some you know, their pros and cons, and in some ways they're nicely complementary. So uh, I'll share a little bit of an intuition of what it, uh, like how you can go about the autoregressive uh, approach to solving this problem. And there are a couple of, uh, we published a paper on this. Uh, it's called Motion LM. So Motion is a language model and, uh, about a year ago. Uh, I think it's a, a really cool paper. Uh, and there are a couple of intuitions behind this. You can kind of treat the driving task as a conversation, right? Uh, so you're kind of interacting with other uh, agents in the world, uh, like in a conversation, right? Maybe, you know, two-way, maybe, you know, with multiple participants. Uh, but instead of using words, you are kind of using your motion, right? And kind of by the, your body language or your driving or walking is, you know, what tells the other participants about you know, what you're doing and what you intend to do. Uh, so that's one intuition. The other in, uh, intuition is that uh, trajectories in the you know, space of driving uh, are not unlike sentences, right? So in sentences... You know, uh, you have words, and they have some local continuity. You know, grammar uh, still matters. Uh, uh, but there's also the kind of the overarching storyline, right? And the global context of the story matters. So understanding that uh, is very important. Uh, same thing as trajectories, right? You have local continuity. You, know, you have, you know, you know, kinematic laws. But also the global context of the scene and the history, you know, really matters uh, when you try to reason about what you should do and what other people are, should be doing in the scene. So in this paper, we just took, you know, some LLM techniques and uh, LLM architectures, and we just treated driving as a, you know, purely kind of a language problem, but in the space of these motion primitives and some, you know, had some interesting results. 
the other high-level approach is to use diffusion models. Uh, you know, they're uh, uh, kind of the, at a high level, the way they work is, you know, you start, uh, I guess I'll use the uh, image here as an example. You start with an image, and then you can have uh, an explicit model that adds noise to it, usually Gaussian noise. Uh, and then, you know, you uh, try to reverse that process. And you train a model to kind of reverse that, that process of noising or denoising. So you start at inference time, you give it some noise, and then it denoises it, and it you know, comes up with something realistic. Okay? Uh, so you can do that for images, you can do that for other tasks. Uh, you can also do the same thing for trajectory. Right? And you start with some, you, know, you train it on, you know, uh, on an explicit model of trajectory and you know, how the states are connected, and then you train it to denoise it, and then at inference time you give it you know, some initial conditions, it can be some noise, it can be some you know, specific uh, other you know, uh, fixed parts of the environment, and then it comes up you know, through this diffusion process with something that is reasonable and realistic. All right, uh, moving on to, you know, briefly to a simulation. Uh, so simulation is uh, super important. Like there's no, and there's a bit of a, kind of a, you know, a chicken and egg problem here. To think about to build a good autonomous vehicle or a good driver, you really need simulation. There's no way around it. You, you need to evaluate and train your system in closed loop, um, and you know believe that just imitation, open loop imitation, is not enough. Uh, now, but to build a good simulator, you have to have realistic, you know, sensing, and you have to have realistic behaviors, right? So to build a good driver, you actually have to build good models of you know other people driving. You know, pedestrians walking, cyclists, cycles, you know, cats and dogs running around, and so forth. Uh, so uh, that makes that problem really, really uh, important and really, really challenging. So again, good simulator, realistic sensing, realistic behavior, and also you need to kind of you know be able to quantify your simulator uh, uh, kind of distributionally across. You know, you can sample some really rare states. But to map it back to the real world, you have to have a quantitative model that says, hey, you know, this sort of unusual stuff happens with, you know, uh, uh, in these contexts with that probability. Otherwise, you know, it's hard to be quantitative about you know, training or evaluation. Uh, you know, here's some examples, and I'm going to, you know, starting with sensor sim, uh, and kind of just scratching the surface, uh, something we uh, was it published about eight, two years ago, uh, some work on. Uh, NERF, so this is uh, neural radiance fields. It's a way to kind of reconstruct a 3D scene from a few you know, camera images. And more lately, uh, this technique of 3D Gaussian splats, you know, splats is becoming very popular, just you know, get uh, good performance and higher efficiency there. Uh, so this is a, a result of us reconstructing a full block of uh, Sutton driving in San Francisco. And it's pretty large scale. Uh, so the, the contribution of this work was you know, really scale and efficiency. Uh, was I think of almost three million images that went into this, and you got you know, very high uh, high efficiency, you know, very scalable approach to you know uh, to doing something like this. Now, once you have that model, you can actually in simulation you can you know tweak it. You can say, hey, like you know, render this scene in different conditions. You know, render it during the day. You know, give it to me during the night, or you know, in with rain, or snow, you know, puddles in the street. So it becomes very very valuable if you want to you know test your system in different conditions. And then, you know, I'm not going to talk about this today, uh, but you also want to do the same thing for dynamic objects, and things get really interesting there uh, as well, especially, uh, you know, when we talk about kind of deformable, you know, objects like pedestrians walking around, you know, but you want to do things like this. All right, thank you. Uh, and then uh, you also, you know, want uh, behavioral uh, realism and simulation. Uh, again, this is where diffusion models we find are uh, pretty interesting, pretty useful. There's a paper we published just this year. Uh, it's called Scene Diffusion, where you know, do the or Scene Diffuser, uh, where you do uh, uh, kind of apply the same techniques that I mentioned a couple of slides ago in the context of just a trajectory, but you do this to a global scene, and then uh, you can the same model uh, gives you a unified approach to both scene initialization and you know world uh, rollout. Uh, and because diffusion models are kind of an explicitly you know, generative process, you can do, it's very convenient you know, to do a few things there. For example, in this process, you can inject constraints. Say, you know, yeah, I don't want collisions, I want cars to stay on the road, and you know, a few other things like that. Super useful when you apply it in practice. And uh, it's also controllable. So you can, you know, at initialization, you can fix some parts of the scene, and you can, you know, kind of uh, uh, simulate others. Uh, or you can take you know, a fully instantiated scenario and inject something in it that is you know, controllable. So you know, in this example, we're taking a scene and we're saying, hey, now inject another car that's cutting me off. 
and you know, then you instantiate it, kind of you seed it with some random noise, and you get you know, all, uh, a number of interesting scenarios that sample that, you know, that particular class of behaviors. Uh, so simulation is very important. It's just one of the tools uh, that we use. You know, one of the, you know, uh, I often say that this problem of evaluating the driver is you know, as hard and as important as actually building it. Uh, and a lot goes into this. This is where a lot of the experience we built over the years uh, you know, uh, really allows us to deploy today you know, at scale and with confidence. It is you know, very multifaceted. We have a number of different methodologies from formal validation to quantitative methods and you know, everything in between. Uh, and we you know, published that on our website at you know, uh, waymo.com.safety. Uh, and this is you know, what it, you know, when you put it all together, uh, when it comes to safety critical scenarios, this is what it looks like. Again, toddler running out in front of the car. This is from our fleet, fully autonomous operations. Another car cutting us off. You kind of have to you know, thread the needle between that car and a pedestrian. Or, you know, a kid on a bike coming from occlusion. So you know, I didn't talk about that, but the, your reasoning about stuff you can see and reading about uncertainty there is super important. A jogger running out. And I think I have my more. Here's another example. Uh, and again, in SF. You have you know, an intersection, our view is occluded by a bus. Again, you have to reason about what's occluded, and then you know, at the last minute, a cyclist comes across. So, you know, all this kind of slice, you know, all of the complexity, the multi agent nature uh, of the problem, and you know, needing to reason about ambiguity and you know, make <coughs> latency critical decisions in those seconds. Uh, but then, ultimately, it's about building an awesome product for our users. So I'm just going to play this video. Get this day going. Let's go. Got our own personal driver, my favorite driver ever. No driver. This is pretty awesome. Last but not least, we can also drive in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> not fully autonomous yet, but yeah, in the future. All right, I'll wrap up this. And uh, you know, do, do we have time for questions? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Cool.